and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, I check out the DKtronics 3 channel sound unit. I play some games, have a chat to Jeff, and end with some promotional material and game art. Let's get on then. The Spectrum was often criticised for its poor sound, and many companies tried different approaches to improve things. Sound amplifiers helped get a better, deeper sound by using a larger speaker, with things like the Stone Chip amplifier doing a great job of this, along with others like the ZX Box. Another option was to improve the sound by using another sound chip, usually an AY chip. Fuller, Voxbox and ZXON opted for this method, as did the DKtronics 3 channel sound unit. Introduced in 1984, this small interface plugged into the back of the Spectrum and came with a sizeable external speaker that looks a bit like the ones you used to get with car stereos back in the day. The unit outputs the Spectrum's beep through this speaker too, but upon first trying this it didn't work. Opening up the interface gave us a look inside too, and we can see the AY chip sat there. A quick clean and a squirt without a proper alcohol seem to fix this. There's a small adjustment dial on the top, accessed through a small hole on the interface, that lets you adjust the beep volume. And the quality of this sound coming out was very good. Now onto the three channel aspect. Loading the accompanying software, we have a simplified version of one of those Pro Tracker tools that you could get for the Amiga and other 16 bit machines. Let's see how it sounds then. Ah, silence. Reading the small manual, it tells you you have to turn on each of the channels and then increase the volume of each of the channels. So the demo software loads with the volume set to zero and no channels turned on. Well, that's useful. The controls for the software are bizarre. Six and seven moves the cursor left and right. Zero does the selection and then eight and nine increases or decreases a setting. Now let's try again. Not at all, especially when the third channel comes in a little bit later. Now then, I suppose we should try and make a song. Using the manual again, you have to go through a lot of steps before you can even start. You have to turn off all the voices, Click record, which then flashes, which indicates it's clearing out all the old tune data. You then have to turn off the envelope generator, turn everything on to tone, and whew, blimey, here we go then. We can select record, and the enabled channel, which you can only do one at once, will indicate that you're now ready to start entering notes. To do this, you move a cursor left and right across a virtual keyboard at the bottom of the screen, and select the note you want. If you want to insert a space, you press the down control, and then use the insert to insert a blank note. It's a bit of a long-winded process, but you soon get the hang of it. Once you've added the first channel, you then select End, turn that channel off, turn on the next channel, and go through the whole process again, slowly building up the song. Eventually, though, you can make a tune, or something that may pass as a tune. This can be saved and used in your games, but obviously it will only work if other people have the same DKtronics unit. There are other options when adding notes, and this involves changing the envelope. The manual says there are 10 different envelope settings, and these are shown in a nice useful graph. Let's try them then. Hmm. No matter what I tried, I couldn't get the thing to play a note with any one of the envelopes. When changing the envelope, the effect just kept on looping. I think there should have been more details about this in the manual.
It was also the same thing for the noise generator. Obviously used for creating drum sounds, but this just kept hissing at me all the time and I couldn't get anything to work. As you can see though, it's not a bad tool once you work out how the controls operate. This unit uses the AY38912 chip, which is used in many similar devices and even emulated in 48k mode in most emulators. So, would it be able to detect games that were written to use that chip in 48k mode, for example like AGD? Ah, uh, the answer is no. I tested it with games that I knew worked on emulators and that produced a Y sound. But nothing out of the DKtronics unit, sadly. Overall then, nice sound, but shame about the interface mechanics. Not a bad piece of kit, but only useful if other people have one. Chrysor was originally launched into the arcades as Contra in 1987 and was a faster run and gun game with varying perspectives, great graphics and sound and hard gameplay. There is a story about aliens taking over the planet and trying to bring on another ice age and setting up their base somewhere on Earth, but this is a shooter so who cares. The same year Ocean Software thought they could convert this impressive game to the Spectrum. This then is Gryzor released by Ocean Software in 1987. I'm surprised anyone thought they could do this justice on the Spectrum, but they seem to have made a good job of it. It's still far too hard for me though. The first section is a left to right scrolling landscape, shooting anything including the various things embedded within the landscape, and as you go along you'll pick up extra weapon upgrades. There are multiple levels on screen including the river which you can go into if you really want to. You can shoot in all directions using combinations of the movement and fire keys and this is essential to take out various enemies that swarm towards you from all angles. The graphics are done really well and the scrolling is smooth too. Because of the textures on some of the landscape though, it's often difficult to see enemy fire resulting in death. The levels are nice and short, and if you are good enough to get that far, you soon get to the next section. Here the view changes to a 3D view, and you have to shoot out the generators on the far wall to disable the force fields, obviously dodging the enemy fire and rolling barrels at the same time. This is a nice break from the main game, but still fast and frantic. I was not really good enough to get very far in this game at all. I managed to finish the first level and get onto the 3D section, but couldn't get any further. So I had to revert to watching the RZX playback so I could see the other areas of the game. There are large boss battles and vertical levels too. So there's plenty of variety on offer. Each level has a different landscape and I'm impressed at how well the game plays compared to the arcade version. If you are good at this sort of game, then give it a try. But it is hard though, and it will certainly give you a challenge.
Tarzan has made a witch doctor angry, and he's turned Tarzan into a monkey. To get back to the tree-swinging hero he once was, you have to guide the monkey on a quest to find certain artefacts that will reverse the spell. The game allows you to set full colour on or off, so we'll start with it on. The game is very similar to other Codemasters games, in that it's a vertical platform game. You guide the monkey up ropes, across platforms and over leaves, avoiding various nasties. You can throw coconuts at them too, and this forms a large part of the game. Scattered about each level are five items, and these are shown at the top of the screen. Once you collect them, it will flash to let you know. The first problem I have is the collision detection with the platforms. It's very hit and miss, and you often fall down a few screens just because you misjudged the part of the scenery that you can land on. Luckily you don't die from falling a long way though, but the enemies do respawn above you so you have to go through it all again. The graphics are well drawn, and colourful in full colour mode, but do suffer from colour clash. The game looks really nice overall though, and everything moves smoothly. Sound is used well with a few tunes and effects here and there. The second problem I had was the jump mechanic. You use the up key to jump, and also the up key to climb ropes and ladders, and this means that you can often jump when you get to the top of a ladder, which you might not think is too much of a problem, but if there are enemies directly above, you can lose a life through no fault of your own. Let's have a quick look at the monochrome mode then. Yes, this just removes the attributes and lets you set the background and foreground colours to whatever you want. This is a good option, as not everyone likes colour clash and not everyone likes monochrome. At the end of each level, there's a kind of bonus round where you have to collect as many diamonds as possible in a set time limit. Overall it's a standard Codemasters game engine with new characters added, but that doesn't mean it's a bad game. I played it for about 30 minutes and got quite far, and was beginning to enjoy it. It's easy to play, and it'll pass 30 minutes or so. Give it a try. This is Project Future, released by Micromania in 1985. Your mission is to teleport onto the SS Future, a gigantic spaceship, and then activate the self-destruct system. Across five decks and 256 rooms, you need to find eight destruction codes before you can finally complete your mission. The list of features looks impressive, and obviously was trying to outdo other rivals at the time. The game though is just a flip screen maze game with shooting, like so many others at the time. You have to explore room after room looking for the codes, and all of the time avoiding or shooting the aliens. The aliens come in many different shapes and sizes, all animated well with smooth movement, but their movement is the same, they just all gravitate towards you. If they block a route, you can just leave the room and then come back in, and they may appear differently which means you'll get a clear path out. They do get in the way a lot though, and they are often impossible to avoid. Along the way you can collect guns and invincibility suits, but the game soon loses any sense of progression. You can teleport to the different decks, but it's still a search and avoid game at the end of the day.
The graphics are nice with colourful walls and the sound is used well, but I didn't like this when I bought it back in 1985 and I still think it's a bit of a letdown today. The corridors are tricky to get around too, with the corners seemingly to have extended boundaries, and this means you can try and turn a corner but are blocked, usually causing death. One interesting note is the game has a bug. The Kempston joystick routines were wrong and swapped the up and down movements around, making it even more tricky. There is a fixed version to download though, but back in the day this must have sent the joystick owners crazy. If you like wandering about endless mazes looking for things, give it a try. Otherwise, look elsewhere for a good maze game. Possibly Saberwolf. This is Bonnie and Clyde by Zosha Entertainment, released in 2020. Here we have an excellently presented game with great graphics and a range of excellent music. The gameplay is simple yet addictive and consists of grabbing all the loot on screen. Once this is done a safe will appear and some dynamite will drop down. You have to grab the dynamite, take it to the safe and blow it up, at which point a ladder appears allowing you to complete the level. There are various gangsters on screen that you have to avoid or shoot, and the levels are really well designed. The graphics are great too, with well drawn backgrounds and smooth sprites. There are various pickups, some freeze the gangsters, others give you extra time, and yes there is a time limit for each level so you can't hang about. Control is really crisp and this is a really enjoyable game. Fantastic! Go and grab it now! Now we're on to some Patreon questions. Some of them we don't really understand, but we'll give it a try. Uh, were UK manufactured Spectrums more or less reliable than Korean ones and why? Uh, to be honest, I've got no idea. Uh... I have no idea either. <laughs> why? Because we've never looked into it? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm not that technical person to know which Spectrums were or weren't. I thought they were all manufactured in Wales, weren't they? In the Hoover Company, no, I was at the C5. I think, C5, I I'm think some of. were. There was some Samsung made some, didn't they? And there was some in in um, Scotland, weren't there as well? I do, I do apologise. We don't know the answer to that one. Yeah. Um, which model of the Spectrum is best, and why? Has to be the Toast Rack, doesn't it? The Toast Rack is a damn good machine. Yeah, and it's the most expensive on and eBay. It is. However, for Nostalgic reasons, it's got to be the rubber keyed one, hasn't it? Surely. Yeah, because it's nice and small, and it, it just looks so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Okay, next. Oh, next, next. oh, of course, the next. You're right. What? Oh, no, I'm saying next question. I didn't say... <laughs> the Spectrum Next is the best. Obviously. All oh, right, okay. Because they're going for two grand on eBay, so they definitely must be. I know, that's, that's madness, isn't it? Yeah. Arcade conversions the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, there are a lot of early terrible ones for things like Galaxians and Space Invaders. Uh, best, I've, I've covered a lot of these in my arcade shootouts. Yeah. Um, I like so Defender. You know, Defender De spelled with an A. Defender by Interstellar Software. Yeah. 
when you did scramble clones, you missed the best one. Which is what? Harrier attack. Is that really a scramble clone? Yes. Are you sure? Are you... Really? Okay. The oh, landscape's you, not continuous you fly, scrolling. You fly vertically. You can bomb. You can shoot. <laughs> okay. Back onto right, topic. Back on topic. Um, bomb Jack was a brilliant conversion. If we're going for rubbish I... ones, in, later in the Spectrum's life, where the arcade machine, arcade machines were already better, better than the Spectrum. Oh, really, really uh, early. Pit on. Fighter. Pit Fighter. <laughs> Pit Fighter. Um, Street Fighter Two. Oh, Outrun. Yeah. Outrun is, yeah, yeah. Outrun was absolutely rubbish. Best compilations or collections? To be honest, I didn't really go for the compilations. I didn't go and buy... I'd rather have the individual games. Oh, there were some good so, ones, though. Um, the four Crash Smashers ones that I think Gremlin did. Right. I had one of those that had Bounder and Alvidas... Not Alvidas, and Monty. Monty on the Run and a couple of other really good ones. I played them a lot. Um, the ultimate collection as well. That was super. ultimate collection. Yeah, it had to be. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if if you were if you were relatively late to the spectrum, then you could get some real classic games on collections yeah, on compilations, could. couldn't you? Yeah. And in fact, you could get them on magazine covers as well. They were pushing out all sorts of things in the nineties, all the early eighties stuff they were pushing out. Okay, next question. Yep. The most annoying aspects of the spectrum and spectrum ownership. Mm. Our tape loading error. You know the. Reset. This is quite topical with the next not having an on-off switch. You know the. Yeah. You know you was reset by pulling the power in and out the back. Yes. And of course, eventually yeah. the the cable got frayed and inside, and your power would become very, very, very kind of twitchy. It was yeah. kind of the, the spectrum version. Would snap of, off altogether. Yeah, yeah, it was the spectrum's version of rampack wobble. I think. It wasn't as annoying as lens lock. Does lens lock <laughs> count? <laughs> lens lock does count, and yes, it was very annoying. Spectrum related merchandise, bags, wallets, keyrings, etc. Um, I presume that means do you have any or do you recommend any or do you know of any? And yes, there are quite a few. You've haven't you got a bag? You've got a Yeah, I've got a bag. I never bag. had any back in the day. No, uh, no, I didn't have any back in the day at all. Now I've got like a a, a man bag. Uh <laughs> set spectrum man bag. Um, right. that I always take to expos and things like that when I go. Um, I haven't got a bag, I do have a cushion. Uh, which was purchased this Christmas for me. I've also got what I now have found out to be a, a phone case, but I didn't know what it was at the time, uh, and that was a nice present as well. It's quite, it's quite present. You do with things like you can get mini 3D printed spect spectrums. I've got one of those. Is that classed as merchandise? I'm not yeah, really sure. it does. Cool mugs. I've got three mugs. Oh, I've got a mug. Yeah, I got a mug recently. Yeah, I've got a Saber Wolf mug. Um, a Spectrum keyboard mug and an Attic Attack mug. So thank you to all those people that uh, provided the questions. I hope you I hope you got the answers you wanted. This is Jaws, released by DK Tronics in 1983. The game was originally released by Elfin Software, but was quickly picked up by DKtronics and published again. The inlay portrays a very different game though, with the Elfin one showing a shark eating treasure and a diver with a knife, none of which are in the game. Treasures and knives are definitely missing. The DKtronics one shows a shark being shot, which is a little more accurate. There isn't much of a story. You are alone in the deep ocean and you have to kill sharks that are threatening the coast. Sounds a bit like the film Jaws to me, but then it gets even better, with jellyfish that have been developed as a secret weapon. The screen shows the sea floor, the ocean and the blue sky above. On the surface of the water are jellyfish and these are constantly firing at you. Yes, these jellyfish are certainly a secret weapon. In the sea are shoals of fish, and this is your target. The control is slightly different from what you would expect, and instead of moving the sights when you press up and down, the whole shoals of fish move up and down. This means there's a different strategy involved. You always shoot in the same place, so you have to manoeuvre the fish into your sights. Shooting the top line first will slowly clear that line and allow the lower fish to move up, eventually killing them all. 
The graphics are average, but the sound is nice for a 16K game. The control works well once you get the hang of it, and I really enjoyed playing this game. A good game then, especially for 16K. My chat with Jeff reminded me of the merchandise companies used to have, and the one company that stuck out for me was Quicksilver. Trawling through the archives unearthed a great amount of information and images. Not only adverts, but pictures from the heyday of the spectrum. Quicksilver produced a calendar that contained images from game inlays. This would have been great on the wall, and the artwork is brilliant. A lot of familiar images there. You could also join the Quicksilver Games Lord Club. You were given a card and a number, and sent various newsletters, mini magazines and special offers. Sadly, there's not a lot of these things scanned in at the moment, and I suspect many of them have been discarded. There is a letter notifying members that the club had to close due to poor response. The letter, though, sadly does not have a date on it. Back to some other interesting things, and there are a few images of Quicksilver at various computer shows, and these are particularly interesting to me. There's a Quicksilver leaflet, and images of some of the Pixel games that they sold. Another interesting piece is the schedule for a programmer's seminar held in Aylesbury in 1984. I presume this would have been to get new coders into the company. There are also ZX81 related things. Look at this picture of the licensed hardware they sold. It's great to wade through all this material, and it's amazing that it's still here and not lost in the dustbins of time. This leads me on to David Rowe. David is an exceptional artist that created some great Quicksilver inlays and is still producing great work today. His website shows off his work and you can even order high quality prints for yourself. I wanted to order about 10 of them, but eventually I opted for two. Remember this magazine cover? Fantastic. Well, that was one of David's, and now a signed print hangs on my wall. And although Frenzy by Quicksilver wasn't a particularly good game, the artwork was superb. And this is the other print that I bought, and together they look absolutely brilliant. There are other artists out there still selling their images from the 80s. Ollie Frey of Crash and Zap fame, not to mention the brilliant work done by Bob Wakeling, sadly no longer with us, that used to adorn ocean titles, and of course Steiner Lund. If you have a bare wall somewhere that needs livening up, go and check out the websites of these brilliant artists. <laughs>